Well, it's great to be here again. Uh, the first lecture I gave in March was a, a foundational and preliminary a message on apologetics and defending the Christian faith. And I talked about worldviews and the importance of presuppositions uh, when doing apologetics. So the first uh, lecture you can see on YouTube was uh, a presentation on apologetic methodology, on the important the mandate to do apologetics, um, the calling that we all have as Christians to defend the faith. And tonight is going to be uh, answering the more specific challenges that are very common uh, in today's culture uh, against the claims of Christianity. So we're going to look at um, the theistic proofs for God's existence, and we're going to look at specifically Christian evidences. And again, if you haven't seen the first video, I would recommend and invite you to watch that presentation because I really emphasize the importance of worldviews and presuppositions while when doing apologetics. So as I'm offering these traditional proofs for God's existence tonight and the Christian evidences, it's very important that we understand that we have to present those evidences and proofs presuppositionally and in light of the knowledge of the differentiation and worldviews that are out there today. So worldview and presuppositions are very foundational and important uh, in defending the Christian faith. So I'm going to first of all uh, just mention, and by the way, there's, there are two, the, the title of these, of this series is A Tale of Two Worldviews. And so ultimately there are two types of worldviews. There are the supernatural worldview and then there's a the naturalistic worldview. And of course there are many different types of uh, supernaturalistic worldviews and I'm advocating of course the Christian uh, supernaturalistic worldview. And I think that ultimately uh, when working out all those other supernaturalistic as well as naturalistic worldviews out to their logical outcome, uh, they, they all reduce to absurdity. And Christianity alone stands uh, as the only viable a worldview. So that's what I'm arguing for the Christian worldview. And just a definition of a worldview, it's a network of presuppositions by which we make sense of the world or interpret the world. And presuppositions are first principles or foundational principles. And everybody has a worldview, and that worldview that everyone holds to is made up of presuppositions. So for example, our basic, most basic presupposition is that God exists. The atheistic or naturalistic basic presupposition would be that God doesn't exist. So when we're doing apologetics, again, this is just review, we need to understand the importance of worldviews and presuppositions when defending the Christian faith. And once we have that understanding on our own and with our opponents that we're dialoguing with, then we can go into the proofs and evidences and use them to uh, reduce, again, our opponent's position to the absurdity that it ultimately is. And I'm not talking about absurdity in, in reference to like silliness or, you know, I'm talking about phil more phil uh, philosophical terms. They, you know, that doesn't, uh, it's not coherent, uh, in other words. So I would invite you to watch that first video uh, when you have the chance, because that's really the foundation. So I want to talk about the, uh, the, uh, proofs for, for God's existence. And again, in my first lecture, I talked about how it's not really ultimately necessary that we have to prove God's existence, because God's existence, according to Paul the Apostle in Romans chapter 1, is already known by all people. So it's not that we have to prove God's existence, but these traditional proofs can be used, again, I think in dialogue to further reduce our opponent's position to um, show them the incoherence that it really is. So I'm going to go through these uh, traditional theistic proofs for God's existence, and then we'll talk more about the specific Christian evidences that really uh, answer the challenges that are very relevant in today's world. So of course, uh, the first uh, 
traditional theistic proof for God's existence is the cosmological argument. And the cosmological argument states that everything that begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And Christian philosophers and theologians and apologists have argued that that cause must be the opposite of the effect. So, in other words, the cause must be uh, personal, it must be timeless, spaceless, uh, etc. Because that which has been created is suspended in space and time. Space and time, it's impersonal, it's material, so therefore the cause must be immaterial. Uh, and so, and you know, we, we get into all the Big Bang cosmology. I know that some Christians aren't comfortable with using the term Big Bang. I use it uh, just as a term for the beginning of the universe. And I think that uh, scientifically uh, speaking now, the consensus is that the universe did have a beginning. So that's the cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And again, the cause must be the opposite of the effect. And that pretty much very well describes God. God is immaterial, he's timeless, he's spaceless, he's personal, uh, he's all-powerful. Uh, so I think the cosmological argument is a good argument, as long again, again as long as you use it presuppositionally and with the idea uh, of knowing the importance of worldview. And uh, just scientifically, this, this argument really has been very beneficial uh, with people who are uh, very scientifically oriented, and so it works. I've used it, and it's worked with uh, people who are atheistic or agnostic. Um, William Lane Craig, uh, one of the most prominent Christian apologists today, uses this argument quite effectively, and uh, a lot of people have been converted to Christianity, not just solely because of this, but it's been used in the, um, for the conversion of uh, people to Christ. And I think the science is in. You know, in 1929, uh, Edwin Hubble, uh, I think Einstein's predictions, Einstein's theory of rel relativity, had predicted that the universe had a beginning. He didn't like that, um, from what I understand. And there was no empirical proof of that until Edwin Hubble discovered um, in 1929 by using a telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory in California uh, that the universe is indeed expanding. And so the, the position is that because the universe is expanding, you could kind of rewind it and bring it back to a single point of singularity, and that would be the beginning. So, and uh, you might have heard of this uh, new uh, theory, and it is, well, I wouldn't say it's a theory. Uh, they like to call it a theory, but it's more of a hypothesis called the multiverse theory, um, that the universe, our universe, is just one of many multiple other universes. Um, but Alex Vilenkin, who's a cosmologist, said even if you hold to this idea of the multiverse, you're still stuck with the problem of a cosmic beginning. So if you hear atheists or agnostics trying to argue the multiverse theory, um, they still have the problem of the multiverse itself having a beginning. So you, you have to, you know, there was a beginning to everything. And again, and, and one more thing, atheists will sometimes try to counter the Christian using this argument, saying that, well, if everything, you know, if everything that exists uh, has a cause, what about God? But that's not the argument. The argument is that everything that begins to exist must have a cause. And we know theologically that God never began to exist. He's eternal, so therefore he does not need a cause. So that's just a brief uh, overview of the cosmological argument. Uh, the teleological argument is the second uh, traditional theistic proof, and that's the argument from design. And it goes like this. Every design has a designer. The universe is highly uh, designed or highly complex, and therefore there must be a designer. And again, if you look at the evidence for that, the scientific evidence, I think it's pretty clear. Again, people are going to interpret the evidence according to their worldview. So a naturalist looking at the evidence for the fine-tuning of the universe will make a claim like, well, it looks designed, it's apparently designed. So again, that's why it's important we understand worldview. So 
we look at evidence and they look at evidence and we're going to interpret that evidence according to our worldview. The question is ultimately, as I explained in my first lecture, what worldview makes the best sense of human experience and can account for our existence? And again, I'm arguing, as many have, that the Christian worldview is of necessity that worldview. But of course, there are tons of evidence for design in the universe. Uh, and then the third argument, I'm just going through these very quickly, the moral argument for God's existence. It goes like this, every law has a law giver. There is objective moral law, therefore there is a moral law giver. So that are, that, those are the three um, traditional theistic proofs for the existence of God. Again, I think they can be used presuppositionally effectively, but ultimately speaking, I don't think that we need to prove God's existence. Now, it may be the case that we need to engage with these arguments more today than 2000, well, I should say maybe four or 500 years because pre-enlightenment, almost everybody held to a theistic worldview. But now we have atheism and agnosticism. This wasn't really an issue. Uh, when the Bible was written in the ancient times, everybody pretty much believed in some sort of uh, God or gods. Um, so everybody sort of presupposed, and I would argue that even unbelievers now need to presuppose, presuppose God's existence in order to make sense of their experience and account for their existence, ultimately speaking. So I think that those arguments are, are valid arguments uh, and can be used presuppositionally. So the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, and the moral argument. And with the moral argument, I just want to talk about the problem of evil very briefly. Um, the argument against God, this is probably probably the primarily arg primarily the primary argument against God's existence is the problem of evil. Uh, atheists and agnostics will argue that because evil exists, a good an all-loving God cannot exist. And if he was go all good and all loving, then he would not uh, permit evil to exist, or at least he would not allow it to exist. Now this is the logical problem of evil, <clears throat> and there's a second type of um, argument from evil which is called the emotive or the emotional, and that's not what really I'm going to get into tonight. But <clears throat> Many atheists today are, have stopped using the logical argument from evil uh, against the existence of God because it's very, simple, it's very simple logically to add a fourth premise to that argument and show that God has a morally sufficient reason for evil to exist. So that's the fourth premise that kind of solves that dilemma. So God is all good, God is all powerful, evil exists. Um, you just add that fourth premise that God has a morally sufficient reason for the existence of evil. That's the logical problem for the, um, against the existence of God. Um, now the emotive issue is a little bit more tough. Um, why does God allow terrible, horrible, tragic, evil things to happen to people individually, etc.? And a lot of times we just don't know the answer to that question. Sometimes it comes later. Um, but there is a lot of evil and suffering in the world. Um, but that's not an argument against the existence of God because God has a morally sufficient reason for allowing those things to happen. So God can be all good and all loving and yet evil exists. In fact, I would turn that argument on the atheist and argue with the atheist that unless God does exist, there is no such thing as objective evil. Uh, if you're an atheist, if you hold to a naturalistic, atheistic, perspective, worldview perspective, there is no such thing as objective evil or objective good. Everything boils down to it being good or bad based upon pleasure. These are the three views of ethics, um, apart from um, grounding ethics in God's existence. Ethics is going to be based upon pleasure, what feels good. It's going to be based upon individual choosing or societal choosing or, or utilitarianism. So a society can decide what's good or bad, or it can be left up to the individual to decide what's good or bad, or it's based simply on pleasure. And of course, that is not objective morality, because that would, 
course, lead to subjectivism and, mor and morality. So that reduces morality to mere opinion. And opinions, if you know anything about logic or argumentation, opinions are based upon personal taste or preference. They have no place in argumentation or logic. So the atheist has no basis for declaring anything to be good or evil, objectively speaking, given their worldview. So their charge against God is really self-refuting when they make those sorts of claims. So if someone approaches you with that logical problem of evil, you can really show them, number one, that that's not a logical problem because God has a morally sufficient reason for allowing evil to exist. And number two, you can turn that argument on them and say, who are you as an atheist, given your worldview, say that anything's evil. You can't declare anything to be evil or good. Objectively speaking, that's the most important thing. They can make claims about evil and, and goodness, but ultimately that's just their opinion if it's not grounded in God. And I would argue that it had to be the God of the Bible. I'm going to skip and then give you the notes this time. I'm going to wait until the end to give the uh, divine hiddenness argument. So those are the three traditional arguments for God's existence. They can be used, I think, appropriately presuppositionally. And the problem of evil is not a problem for the Christian, everyone. It's a problem for the atheist. And that's, we have, I think it's important to understand that. So now I, wanted to, now I want to get into Christian evidences. So if everybody believes in God, and Paul says that all people do know God, they know it through the creation and through their conscience, it's not natural theology again, it's just natural revelation. It's, the, it's an instant awareness of God's uh, existence that every human being has. They suppress that truth in their unrighteousness, and that's why you have people claiming to be atheists or people worshiping Allah or whatever it is. They can exchange the truth of God for a lie, but all people ultimately know that God exists. However, what God has revealed himself, how God has revealed himself in natural revelation, uh, doesn't give a lot of specifics, and so that's where special revelation comes into play. And in the New Testament, even in the Old Testament, you have examples of prophets and apostles using evidences to show that Christianity is true, that Jesus is the Messiah, etc. So I think it's even more appropriate uh, that we can use evidences for Christianity to show that Christianity is the one true religion and that the God of the Bible is the one true God who exists in the person of Jesus. So I'm going to go through some evidence, Christian evidences now, and being a, a teacher now for 14 years, a theology and apologetics teacher, these are the, the most frequent challenges and questions that I get. And so I'm going to give you uh, some basic information on how you can answer these specific challenges to the Christian faith. We've already looked at the problem of evil, so you should be able to respond to that one. Again, not so much the emotive problem of evil. Um, so if you have somebody that comes to you and is undergoing a great tragedy, it's not really going to be helpful to talk to them about the logical problem of evil and God has a morally sufficient reason. We're going to use that in, type, in debate type settings. But when somebody comes to you who's going through a horrible tragedy, you know, I think that all we can do as pastors and ministers is to pray and just be with that because it, we just don't know. At some point, you, I've had a couple tragedies in my life that I didn't understand until much later why God allowed that to happen. So it could be, it may not ever come. And you may not know that until we get to um, eternal, into the eternal state. So I want to first talk about the uh, reliability of the Bible. Secondly, uh, the problem, well not the problem, they say it's a problem of miracles. Then we're going to look at the historical Jesus and then the resurrection. And the resurrection, everyone, is it. When you're, when you're doing apologetics with someone, whether it be a Muslim or an atheist, you can use the cosmological, teleological, all that kind of stuff, but focus really on Jesus. Because the evidence for Jesus is just overwhelming. And even atheists and agnostics will agree to a lot about what Jesus is. Uh, who he was and what he said, and you even see that in the ancient world. Okay? So let's talk about, and by the way, this is everybody, I hear all the time, that the Bible's full of errors and the Bible's full of mistakes. How can you trust the Bible? How can you claim for it 
how can you claim it to be the Word of God and yet it be full of all these contradictions and errors and stuff like that? Well, if that were true, uh, I would be the first to stand up and tell you and tell the student, my students that's the case. However, it's not the case. And uh, you may know of a gentleman, a professor named Bart Ehrman, who came out with a book in around 2007 called Misquoting Jesus, in which he talked, it was the first popular book ever done on textual criticism. And it may, I mean, it sent, sent shockwaves through the Christian world. I remember uh, at the church I was, where I was at the time, we had to do lectures and seminars because even the church was really affected by this book and these claims that the Bible is full of errors. And um, I mean, it's been a claim for thousands of years, but this book, Bart Ehrman's popularity, I think, uh, had a lot to do with it. But he argued in the book that there are about four to 500,000 uh, textual variants in the New Testament. We're going to stick with the New Testament first and talk briefly about the Old Testament. But he argued quite correctly, I should say, that in the New Testament documents, there are about 400 to 500,000 textual variants. And textual criticism, the, the, the study of textual criticism is to seek to discover what the original said. That's the purpose of textual criticism. So in textual, textual critics, they gather all the avail, available extant manuscripts of that specific writing, and they compare them. And textual criticism is when you look through all the extant text of that particular document, and when there's a difference in the text, that counts as a textual variant. So a textual variant is just any difference in the text. It doesn't necessarily mean a contradiction, it's just a difference in the text. But atheists and like Bart Ehrman, they like to use uh, language to incite and, um, you know, but, you know, he knows better than that. And he's been called out on that quite a bit uh, over the years. But he will say that they're contradictions. And he'll make claims like, uh, there are 400,000 mistakes in the Bible. Why should you believe the Bible is a word of God? And he's a professor at uh, UNC. And uh, even today, I've heard that his classrooms are, are standing room only. I mean, he is influencing a lot of people. And if you're a college student, 70% of freshmen now went up. 70% of college freshmen who go to college claim to be a Christian by the time they graduated have denied the faith. And it's because they're hearing stuff like this. So if I'm sitting in a classroom as a freshman, having grown up as a Christian all my life, you know, maybe sheltered, and uh, there's a professor up there saying, you know, there's 400,000 mistakes, and he's a PhD. You know, there's 400,000 mistakes in the Bible. I'm going to think twice. I'm going to say, maybe, maybe it's party time. You know, I'm away from my family for the first time. 400,000 mistakes? How can it be the Word of God? But of course, uh, he's not being totally uh, transparent when he talks about what these four... Now, all textual critics, Dan Wallace of the Dallas Theological Seminary, who's probably the most prominent evangelical textual critic, Critic today, he agrees with Ehrman that there are about 400 to 500,000 textual variants in the New Testament documents. So we're going to talk about that. 99%, um, and I've heard 99.5, 99.9% of all textual variants in the New Testament have absolutely no significance to the meaning of the text. Now, Bart Ehrman, when he says there are 500,000 textual variants, he doesn't really go into that too much unless pressed. I've watched hours and hours of his debates. So, if 99% of those 400,000 textual variants have no bearing on the meaning of the text, I mean, that's pretty significant, everyone. 99%, almost 100% of the variants have no, um, uh, they have nothing to do with the meaning of the text. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. We're gonna look at the textual evidence in a moment. So what are the 99% of textual variants? Well, there are three categories. Spelling errors, word order, and synonyms. That makes up 99% of all the textual variants of those 400 to 500,000 textual variants. If you know anything about Greek, you can have words in any order in a sentence. So um, I think Dan Wallace did this. He's the textual critic at Dallas Theological Seminary. I think he said you could say John loves Mary in Greek like over a hundred different ways by word order. 
Because in Greek, you don't need to have words in a certain order. So word order, so if I'm looking at a text from Matthew, chapter 12, verse 4, and another, and the word order is different, that has no bearing on the text. That's just, you know, you could write that way in Greek. So that's considered a textual variant. Spelling differences. Um, I have one example in my notes of John's name. We have several texts of the New Testament manuscript that spells John's name like three different ways because there was no systematic uh, categorical way of spelling uh, in the ancient world in a, lot of, in, a, in a lot of ways. So you have Ioannis with two N's or two new's in Greek, and you have Ioannis with one new. That's considered a textual variant. It's a difference in the text. And the third is synonym. So you might have a... Uh, uh, Jesus Christos, um, I'm sorry, that's the word order. And that's another example of a, textual, uh, of a textual variant with the word order. Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ, that's counted as one of the textual variants. Okay. And I'll talk more about some more specifics in a moment. <clears throat> um, but the, what was the third one? Uh, synonym. So you might have Jesus is Lord in one text, and the other text will say Jesus is Theos, or God. So that's an actual textual variant that we have. So it's just a synonym change, Lord and the or kurios and theos, Lord or God. They really don't have any significant, um, they don't take away from the meaning of the text in any way whatsoever. So 99% of the four to 500,000 textual variants are either spelling differences, now Irma will say spelling errors, but again, that's not correct. Spelling differences, word order, or synonym changes. That's 99%. I'll give you a couple more specifics here, some of the more interesting ones. Uh, this is a textual variant that make up the 99%. So in Luke 2.41, we have one text manual. These are just examples to show you what these kind of variants are. So in Luke chapter 2, verse 41, the passage talks about Jesus and his parents. That's an actual Greek manuscript that we have. In another Greek manuscript that we have, of the same verse, Luke chapter 2, verse 41, it says Jesus and Joseph and Mary. Parents, Joseph and Mary. They were his parents. So there's no significance there. It's just a difference in translation. In Luke 9, 11, it says Jesus called the 12 in one text. In another text of the same verse, it says Jesus called the 12 disciples. That's a textual variant. And that makes up 99% of the four to 500,000 textual variants. And in ancient um, textual criticism, that's pretty amazing. That the scribes were that careful in, in um, copying these texts. So what about the 1%? So 99% of the textual variants are spelling differences, um, word order changes, and synonyms. What about the 1%? Now, there are some interesting textual variants in the 1%, but again, even the 1% has no bearing on the meaning of this text at all. The two most prominent are the woman caught in the adultery passage in John 8. And any person with any sort of sense who's had a Bible can look in their Bible and see the brackets right around that passage. It's been there forever, and it says this verse was not in the, in the oldest and some say most reliable manuscripts. So we've known about that for hundreds of years. Um, so that's one of the 1%. And the other is the ending of Mark 16. Again, another bracketed passage in your English Bibles. It'll say this ending of Mark was not in the earliest manuscripts that we have the Greek New Testament. Big deal. Okay? If you, I don't hold to those passages being part of Scripture. I think the evidence is clear that they were added much later. But when you take the woman and adultery passage out, even though it's a great story, and you take the Mark ending out, and the Mark ending, if you're not familiar with it, that's the one where it says the apostle will pick up snakes and drink poison and stuff like that. The earliest manuscripts ends before that is on there. And it's, by the way, some text in the New Testament we have, that passage in John is actually in Luke from the woman called adultery. There are a couple texts that have been found where that passage the woman caught in adultery is actually in the Gospel of Luke. So that would be considered a textual um, variant. Just a couple more examples to show you what we're dealing with. Uh, in Mark 
Uh, there's one text that says that when Jesus said you have to cast out these demons with prayer and fasting, one passage, one text only says prayer, but we have a later text that adds prayer and fasting. So that's a textual variant. Again, no big deal. 1 John 1 4, uh, there's our joy versus your joy, and it's based upon one differentiation of letter in the, um, the Greek. Uh, one, of, one I found most interesting is uh, you eschatology buffs are going to enjoy this one. We all know the number of the beast, 666, correct? Well, in the majority text, that's the number in the Greek uh, text, 666. But in the two earliest manuscripts of the book of Revelation, the two earliest, the number is not 666, it's 616 in both Greek New Testament manuscripts. So that's an example of a textual variant. The two earliest manuscripts of Revelation, 616, all the later majority text, 666. So what's going on with that? Well, I take the position that uh, the book of Revelation was written uh, primarily to uh, the audience of the first century. It had to do with the destruction of Jerusalem, and the beast is Nero. And so 666 equals Neron C, Kaiser's name perfectly, and so does 616. Okay, it's an ancient technique, um, what is it, uh, gamatria, and that's when languages have letters, and those letters are translated into numerals. And so 616 and 666 both equal the same person's name, Nero Caesar, perfectly. So that's not a big deal, they're both saying the same thing, given that perspective. So that's just ex some examples of the 1%. So everyone, we really have nothing to worry about with the reliability of the New Testament. It's been estimated if you took the average classical author and stacked their writings up, it would be about four feet high. The amount of New Testament manuscripts that we now have is about 6,000, it would go over a mile high. And the earliest New Testament manuscript that we have is dated to about uh, 100 to 125. It's a fragment of John, and by 325 and 350, we have two complete texts of the New Testament as we have it today. Now, if you look at other ancient writings from that period, there's nothing in comparison to the manuscript evidence for the New Testament. So we have about 5,886, I believe, New Testament manuscripts. A manuscript, by the way, is a handwritten document. So these are all manuscripts written before the printing press. So about 6,000 Greek New Testament manuscripts. 99% of the textual variants have no bearing whatsoever. 1%, no significance whatsoever. This is amazing stuff. This is ama you have no doubt. You should be completely confident in, in the authority or reliability of, of the New Testament. In the Old Testament too, which I'll briefly talk about in a moment. The reason we have so many textual variants is because we have so many manuscripts, and that's a good thing. So we have these multiple attestations of text and how they were copied, etc., and how much care was taken. So I'll just give you a, a couple of examples. So, oh, by the way, we have 10,000 Latin New Testament manuscripts, and we have about another 10,000. New Testament manuscripts, again, a handwritten document in other languages like Coptic, etc. Not only that, everyone, we have over a million quotes from the New Testament from the church fathers. So if you look up on that shelf, there are 38 volumes of church fathers. The church fathers quote the New Testament over one million times. It's been said that if we didn't have any New Testament manuscripts, we could reconstruct the entire New Testament from the early church fathers. They quoted almost every verse of the New Testament. So it's pretty impressive. Now, I just read in Biblical Archaeological Review this week that they discovered another text at um, Olympia. I was there a couple years ago in Olympia, Greece, and they discovered a fragment of uh, Homer's Odyssey, and they dated that to about... They originally thought it was like a first century, and that would have been the oldest copy of a Homer, but now they're dating it to about 300 to 350 AD. So it's actually a little older. But uh, the Iliad is the second best attested ancient document that we have. We have about 2,200 um, 
Greek text of the Iliad, and the earliest is about 350 years to 400 years after um, the writing. All the others are just, for example, I'll just give you some. Josephus, uh, the great Jewish historian, we have about 20 copies of his writings. And the first copy is dated to about 800 years after he lived. Uh, Aristotle, uh, any of his uh, various works, the average is about 49 copies. The earliest copy of Aristotle is about 1,400 years after he lived. Uh, Tacitus, a thousand years after he lived, 20 copies. Plato, 1,200 years, about seven copies in the Greek. Thucydides, 1,300 years after he lived, eight copies. So when you compare all these other ancient writings to the New Testament, the New Testament evidence is overwhelming and overabundant compared to other ancient uh, writings. Now there are textual variants in these other writings, um, but it's interesting to me that scholars don't really question too much these other writings as being authentic. I know there are some issues with some of Plato's writings, you know, did he write this many dialogues or that many, but it's always the Bible. Of course that exposes the world view, not only of unbelievers but of Satan, ultimately. And I want to emphasize again I'm a very rational person, but we are involved in spiritual warfare. That's uh, very, very real. And so the Bible's attacked. But everyone, the evidence is just not supportive of the claim that the Bible's not. Every archaeological discovery, you know, all these... Up, did you know up until 1961, scholars were questioning the existence of Pontius Pilate? Now, I know how they were doing that, but... In 1961, they found Pilate's inscription at Caesarea. Um, so, I mean, every every time, the, the, the um, pool of uh, Bethesda, or Bethsaida, was just discovered, not just discovered, but discovered in the 20th century with the five pillars, just like the New Testament said. The New Testament, everyone, is the best attested ancient document that we have. And there should be no lack of confidence in the New Testament as being reliable. And of course, we as Christians holding to our worldview would say that it's inerrant and inspired as well. And there are reasons for that. But historical reliability, everyone, no problems there. The Old Testament's pretty similar. Up until the 1940s, the oldest Old Testament manuscript, complete Old Testament manuscript in Hebrew was the Leningrad Codex. But in 1946, I believe, something miraculous happened and the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were discovered. And every single book of the Old Testament was found at the Dead Sea except Esther. And uh, the, the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls matched very well with the Leningrad Codex. And remember, these are written a thousand years earlier. So that the scribes and the rabbis who copied the, uh, the Masoretic text, etc., uh, they, they took great care in preserving the Old Testament. So there's not much textual criticism, by the way, going on with the Old Testament, okay, because it's pretty solid. I mean, nobody really questions it. The New Testament's being attacked now uh, quite copiously. Uh, but the Old Testament, same issue, everyone. No reason to doubt. I mean, there are textual variants in the Old Testament. Um, just like in the New Testament, but nothing to uh, be concerned about at all. So let's talk about the historical Jesus. Well, let me say this. Um, there are different... The Gospels seem to be attacked more and more now, the Gospels. And uh, there are differences in the Gospels, but Mike Lacona and a scholar named Richard uh, Burridge have done a lot of work showing that the Gospels are ancient biography. That's the genre of literature that the Gospels are. And so when we look at the Gospels, we're not to look at them from a 21st century bio biographical perspective. We're to look at them in line with the ancient biographies that were written. And Plutarch was the great writer of biographies in the ancient world. There are about 100 ancient biographies that we have today, extant, written by different people. Uh, but Plutarch wrote over 50 of them. And you can get his lives of the Greeks and lives of the Romans. So he wrote over 50 different biographies. And he used, there's a lot of differences. And he's telling the same story. 
So like Lacona and Burridge and these scholars, they've compared the Gospels to the ancient biography, and they've discovered some quite amazing things. And uh, I think they're correct, because in the Gospels you do have differences. For example, in Luke, uh, when you have the, the healing of the centurion servant, uh, it's the uh, servant who comes out to meet Jesus and ask him to heal the centurion's other servant. But in Matthew, it's the centurion himself who asks Jesus. So what's going on there? That seems to be a contradiction. Luke records that it was a servant who talked to Jesus. But Matthew records that it was uh, the centurion himself. In Matthew... Do uh, you remember the story when the apostles, John and James, come to Jesus and say, can we sit on your right and left in the kingdom? Well, in Mark, it's James and John who ask Jesus that question. But in Matthew, it's his mother. They get their mother to ask the question. So what's going on there? Is that a contradiction? Well, according to ancient biographical standards, it's not. And they came up with uh, several uh, techniques that ancient biographers use uh, which were viable then, and that's the way we should read the Gospels. So, for example, uh, in the ancient biographies, they have what's called transferal. That's when uh, one person, the saying of one person will be transferred to another, like you have in the uh, scene with the mother. Uh, you have that in Plutarch's writings. Uh, I think the story of the Cicero and Cato, uh, there's a story like that. Um, you have compression, where they take um, episodes and they boil them down and take out some of the details. They have spotlighting, for example, uh, in the Gospels when you have Mary uh, at the tomb speaking at Jesus' uh, resurrection tomb, but doesn't mention the names of other women. But in other, in the other Gospels, you have Mary and other women's names mentioned. Well, in that instance, it's spotlighting Mary because she's the one who spoke. It doesn't mean that other women weren't there with her. So I would invite you. I think it's a. The book is called. Um, I can't think of the name of the book, uh, but it's by Mike Lacona. If you're really interested in the Gospels and biography issue, um, you can look that up. That's kind of a new book that just came out, and I think he's done a great job at showing um, that's, that we need to look at the Gospels as ancient bios or biographies and look at it that way. And then they're not contradictions. They're just ancient biographical techniques that were used and were common in the ancient world. The historical Jesus. Now there are a few people, very, very few. I could probably name them on one hand, but they do have a lot of influence on the internet. You know how the internet is. They are arguing that Jesus never existed, that Jesus was just a mythological creature, and if Jesus never existed, of course he couldn't die and rise again, etc. So Jesus never existed, all of Christianity cannot be true. Now, that's been debunked, I think, pretty clearly by uh, scholars. But I just want to go through some of the evidence for the historical Jesus. And there are a lot of extra... Now, the Gospels themselves are historically reliable. Okay? They, they should be seen as historically reliable documents. Okay? The evidence is, again, overwhelming for the historicity. And again, if we're looking at the Gospels um, as being ancient biography, I think that helps explain... Uh, those differences in the text, what what the writers were doing. And remember, Jew, there were no such thing as Jewish biographies. The Jews, for some reason, did not write, write biographies of their sages or heroes. So when the gospel writers were writing these bio, biographies of Jesus, they didn't have Jewish sources to look to. So they had to model their gospels on Greco-Roman biographies. And so the Greco-Roman biographies had all these different, and they were considered contradictions in the ancient world. They were considered literary differences, you know, a genre, you know, according to that genre. So the writers of the Gospels were using that technique. So we can't, you go to a um, bookstore today and pick up a biography, it's very different than what an ancient biography would be. Ancient biographies highlighted a person and their teaching. It didn't highlight a lot of events in their lives. That's why we don't have a lot of events even and plus, in ancient biography, the biographies usually pick up at the point when the person starts something, like a, their, we would say ministry with Jesus, but when they started their professional life or their public life. So when you're reading ancient biographies, you don't get a lot of stuff about Cicero and 
Kato, I keep mentioning them, I like them a lot, or those guys when they were little. This, just like with Jesus, we don't have anything about his youth except for the one incident at the temple. But that's the way ancient, so I think the Gospels are modeled in the ancient Greco-Roman biography, and when we read them that way, they're not contradictions, everyone. They're just lit the literary genre of the day. There's about a dozen or so ancient extra-biblical texts that mention Jesus or allude to Jesus. And we can know four things. So if we so if we didn't have the New Testament, we can know four things, I think, with certainty about Jesus from all these extra-biblical sources. And a lot of them are written in the first century. We can know, number one, that Jesus existed. Number two, that he was considered a miracle worker. You have texts that talk about Jesus being a miracle worker. Third, that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And fourthly, that the disciples, his apostles, believed that he had risen from the dead. Now these extra biblical sources don't say that Jesus did rise from the dead, but they indicate very clearly that his disciples believed that he had risen from the dead. So there you got the gospel. He lived, he died, he was a miracle worker, and he rose from the dead. And you get that all that information from the extra biblical sources. And hardly any ancient scholar questions these sources as being reliable. For example, I'll just give you a couple of examples. One of my favorites is a guy named Kelsus. If you never read Kelsus, he's a very interesting guy. He was like the original Richard Dawkins or something of uh, the ancient world. And he was vehemently vile in his uh, attacks on Christians. He's the one that propagated the position that, and by the way, this is the <clears throat> way he tried to explain away the virgin birth. Kelsus says that Mary had had uh, sexual relations before she was married with Joseph with the Roman soldier. And so that's how she got pregnant. So Kelsus in 175 AD in the second century knows that there was something super natural or you know special about his birth and so he's trying to explain it away by saying oh she must have had adult committed adultery with a Roman soldier. But Kelsus says this. He says Jesus was uh, reported to have done great miracles but uh, the miracles that he done were acts of magic or trickery. And Kelsus writes that um, Jesus, when he went down to Egypt, and we know that from the Gospels, that Jesus went down to Egypt, Kelsus says that when Jesus went down to Egypt, that's when he would have learned magic in order to come back to Israel and uh, trick the people into believing that he was the Messiah. So again, you have Kelsus, the most vehement critic uh, in the ancient world of Christianity, trying to explain naturalistically or whatever away Jesus' miracles. Okay? Josephus, a great Jewish historian, uh, mentions that Jesus uh, was purported to be a great miracle worker. Now there are some problems with some of the uh, text in Josephus. I think all scholars agree that some of the stuff was added later, but the core is there. Uh, Josephus mentions Jesus twice, by the way. He mentions James, the brother of Jesus, as well. <clears throat> Josephus mentions Tacitus, the great Roman historian in the first century. Uh, Pliny, the younger, who was a uh, governor to the emperor Trajan. Uh, Suetonius, the second great Roman historian, mentions, uh, talks about Jesus. You have Lucian, who was a, a Greek playwright and comedian, who talks about the Christians... Uh, the Christians worship a crucified uh, man. Uh, and he's doing it uh, sarcastically. And when I was in Rome, I got to see the. Uh, in Rome, uh, there's a. It's in the museum now, but it used to be out on the uh, forum. There was a. From the first century, it was a cross. Somebody did graffiti in the first century, a cross. And on the cross, it had a man's body with a, with a donkey's head on it. And it says, This is the God that. I can't remember the name of the person worships. So it was a jackass, right? So the, the, the Roman was making fun of his friend who worshipped this crucified uh, man. And that's important when we get to the resurrection. So you have overabundance of uh, evidence for Jesus uh, existing. Um, even the Quran, which is uh, written a few hundred years after, uh, mentions Jesus quite a bit. So you have a lot of ancient, and that's still considered the ancient world, or at least uh, the, the border of the ancient world. 
So you have a lot of extra biblical testimony to the basic events of Jesus' life. So miracles and then lastly the resurrection. Because the resurrection is a miracle, we have to make sure that we can um, argue uh, that miracles can exist. And it's very simple. Now I hear atheists and agnostics and all these critics saying miracles are not possible because they're violations of natural law and all this stuff like that. I, I don't take I don't use the term violation, I, I use the term suspension of natural law. But here's the point. If God created the natural law, he can necessarily suspend the natural law and do a miracle, right? I mean it's a really poor argument. In the ancient world there was no there wasn't this false dichotomy that we have now post enlightenment of um, supernatural versus natural. Everything was together then. It wasn't until the Enlightenment that we had the separation of supernatural and natural. But here's the point. Miracles, and, and they'll say that the Gospels can't be historical, historically reliable because they contain miracles. But here's the point. Miracles, by their very definition, are supernatural events that take place in space and time. That's why they're a miracle. So if they take place in space and time, they can be recorded in space and time. It's very simple. I mean, I think some Christians hear that and they don't know how to respond. But that's one of the weakest arguments that an atheist can bring against Christianity. That miracles aren't possible because they're violations of natural law. And you can't, they can't, this can't be a historical record because it contains miracles. And I think that's just absolutely ridiculous. Again, see there, you have the naturalistic worldview versus the supernaturalistic worldview. I read a few years ago about two scholars, critical scholars, who said, yeah, we agree that Jesus probably fed the 5,000, but they gave this explanation. They said Jesus must have, days before this event, knew this was going to happen, and him and his apostles went to town, bought a whole bunch of bread and a whole bunch of fish, and they hid it in a cave, at the top of the Sea of Galilee. And so when Jesus is up there doing the blessing, the apostles are handing him out the fish and the loaves out of this hole in the cave, and he made it look like he had done a miracle. See, that's the naturalistic perspective trying to, according to their worldview, remember a naturalistic worldview, no miracles are possible. You don't have anything outside the material, physical world. So they have to find some sort of explanation. So Jesus was a magician. He tricked the people. I, you know, it's you know, it's not really plausible, even even for a rational person who's not a Christian to think that. But they're just so desperate. And remember, last time I talked about the unbelieving mind, how darkened and futile the unbelieving mind is, that they go to such extent. That's important. So now we get to the resurrection. Everyone, Paul says that the Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection. Paul says if the resurrection did not occur, then we're all, we're all doomed. We're living our life in vain. When I'm going through a tough time, this is what I immediately go to, is the resurrection of Jesus. Because when you look at the evidence, there is no other possible, plausible explanation for the empty tomb. I mean, there just is not. And here's the point. If, the, if there was an empty tomb, Jesus rose from the dead. And if Jesus rose from the dead, he is who he claimed to be. And he is God Almighty. And we are to put our full faith and trust in him, trust in him in this life and then for eternity. Because we'll be resurrected too. But when you look at the evidence for the resurrection, it just, this is my greatest comfort. And I think Paul uh, says that too. So let me talk in conclusion, about the beauty and the awesomeness of the resurrection of Jesus. Almost all scholars believe that the tomb was empty on the third day. Now you have some critical scholars now who say that Jesus probably wasn't buried in the tomb. He's probably thrown into a common grave. But the evidence, if you want to read about that, I can give you info. It's just been completely debunked, even on the internet it's still quite popular. But if the tomb, the tomb was empty, on the third day the tomb was empty. There have been all sorts of crazy explanations as to how the tomb became empty on the third day. So, I heard this one a few years ago and I thought it was something new, but as I was reading ancient sources a while back, it actually was uh, 
a um, explanation that was given in the ancient world that Jesus had a twin brother. And uh, after Jesus, this is serious, after Jesus died, his twin brother who had waited all these years because he was so jealous of his older brother, yes, Jesus is finally dead. I'm going to come back. I'm going to pretend to be him. So this twin brother somehow got the body, disposed of the body. The Romans and the Jews couldn't find it. And so he pretends to be Jesus, I guess, for 40 days. And then his time's up. His moment of fame's over. Because remember, Jesus is not... He, he goes away after 40... It's ludicrous, it's silly, it's stupid. But that is a view that was actually held in the ancient world trying to explain, explain naturalistically the empty tomb. The second one, that the, that the apostles came and stole the body, that's universally rejected now by almost even almost all critical scholars. Because there's just no way that the apostles came and stole the body. A body that was guarded in a tomb made out of stone with a two-ton stone in front of it with Roman guards in front of it and a seal of Pontius Pilate put over it and to break a Roman seal, of course, was death. And so the disciples coming stealing the body, by the way, if they would have stole the body, it would have been quickly discovered and presented to the people by the Romans. There would have been no way they could have, they could have got out of Jerusalem with the body. The, 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 uh, Jesus wasn't really dead. Are you kidding me? Jesus wasn't really dead. That's called the swoon theory, right? Jesus was beaten almost to death, crucified, put into a tomb, and somehow by himself, from the inside, moved the two-ton stone after all that loss of, you know, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, that's, that's one that came up. And uh, so that's the main ones. There's no evidence, shred of evidence to uh, point to that. Now some critics have argued that hallucinate that the apostles did believe that they saw Jesus after his death, but they hallucinated it. Psychologically speaking, psychologically, journals, you know, you can read in the psychological literature, there are no such thing as group hallucinations. So you have 500 people seeing Jesus raised in heaven. Paul talks about that. Um, hallucinations do not occur in groups, so that doesn't explain away the group hallucinations. Hallucinations are private, personal, uh, etc. So groups were not, and by the way, if it was a group hallucination, that'd be a miracle. And so, explain that one. You have the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Um, something monumental happened for the Jews to change their worship from the Sabbath to the Lord's Day. I mean, we don't understand that in our, in our modern 20, 21st century American eyes, how significant that was for the Jews to change their day of worship from the Sabbath to the first day of the week. So what happened to cause these early Jews to do something so dramatic to ostracize themselves from the rest of their community? It's called the resurrection of Jesus. Everyone. That's what happened to cause them to change that. I mean, that's a big thing. By the way, I don't believe that the Jews were ever to be worshiping on the Sabbath. Um, I, that came, that whole thing, the synagogue came into being during the exile as a form, in, in reference to judgment. But that's what they were doing at that time. And suddenly you have all these Jews worshiping on the Lord's Day. That was monumental. If the gospel writer is called the criterion of embarrassment, one way to authenticate a document is if there are embarrassing doc details in the document that lends towards credibility. If you're arguing for the... Re Number one, the Jews had no... Con Let me say this. Jews had... N.T. Wright has done a lot of great work on this. Jews had no concept of a, of, of a resurrected Messiah... They had no concept of people being resurrected uh, before the general resurrection. So this is not something that the apostles would have had in their mind to make up. The Jew, Second Temple Judaism, if you read the literature, had no concept of that. They had a general resurrection at the end of time, but no sort of individualistic resurrection uh, before that period. So they're not going to make that up because they would have never even thought of that that the Messiah was... They, wouldn't, they had no concept that the, the Messiah was going to die on a cross, you know, until later, until it finally fit in. Especially Paul. Paul's trying to, in the book of Romans and other Galatians, trying to relate a dead, crucified Messiah with the fulfillment of the... You know, it's just amazing stuff. 
And, and you're not going to have the women going to the tomb first. In all the gospel accounts, the men are away hiding, right? And the women go to the tomb. And in, in Jewish and in Greco-Roman times, women were not considered nor allowed to be eyewitnesses. So if you're making up a story, everyone, that Jesus resurrected from the dead, you're not going to have women as the first witnesses because they were not seen as credible witnesses. You're not, you're not thinking very straight in doing so. Almost all the apostles, with perhaps uh, with the exception of John, uh, traditionally died for their belief in the resurrection. People die for a lie all the time, but people don't die for a lie that they know they may have. So if you're Peter or one of these apostles or early Christians, and they're, you, you are threatened with crucifixion, and you know you're going to be... And by the way, there are so many... Read, um, read the early accounts of the martyrs. It will really get you thinking about how blessed we are and how great their testimony was. If you're standing before a Roman procurator or proconsul, and they say, if you don't recant this belief, you're going to die a horrible death. If I, didn't, if I knew that wasn't true and I just made it up, I'd been the first person. Okay, I'm going home. I'll sign whatever you need me to sign. But they all died for their faith. They, they died for their belief in the resurrection. Why? Because they experienced it. Lastly, you have the two great enemies. Well, not two great. You have the great enemy of Christianity. Everyone, something happened to Paul on that road to Damascus that changed him and changed the course of world history. That man was going to kill Christians. Okay? Something happened. He was an enemy. He wasn't a uh, proponent of Christianity. Something happened that changed Paul, and Paul became the great apostle to the Gentiles. What happened? He experienced the resurrected Jesus Christ. That's the only explanation for Paul's sudden, I mean drastic, sudden uh, conversion. And what does Paul do? He goes to Rome and is beheaded for his faith and belief in the resurrection. James, the brother of John. From what we know, James is a skeptic. I mean, uh, James, the brother of Jesus. He was a skeptic during Jesus' life. But James becomes a Christian because he saw his half-brother resurrected from the dead. So, the resurrection, everyone, is uh, the primary, essential uh, aspect of our faith. And if the resurrection is true, and Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is God. Christianity is true. The Bible is true. And that means all other religions are necessarily false. Because it's the resurrected Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. Jesus' resurrection proved his claims to be the Messiah along with a lot of other things, including his miracles. You know, only God has the power of demons, weather, and sickness, and that's why Jesus did those types of miracles. So, everything points to, to the existence of the Christian God, everyone. Whether it be the beginning of the universe, the design in the universe, the fact that there is objective morality, the problem of evil. Evil can only, if, if, if God doesn't exist, everyone, there is no evil, but we all know that there is real evil in this world. What Hitler did, to the Jews, abortion, all this stuff, that's pure evil. And we know that that's objectively evil. It's not just our opinion. And it's only objectively evil because God does exist. God does not exist. Morality is simply pure opinion. The Bible is historically reliable. The manuscript evidence is overwhelming. Miracles are possible because God does exist. Jesus existed. And we know from even the extra-biblical sources, he lived, he died, he was reported to be a miracle worker, and that the disciples believed that he rose from the dead. And then finally we get to the resurrection. No other plausible explanation for the empty tomb except that he rose from the dead as he claimed he would. Remember that? And only God can predict their own death and uh, you know rising from the dead. So everyone, we have made. We have it made as Christians and we are to be so thankful and we need to be going out defending the faith, sharing our faith with, faith with others. And so I hope that this information, it's just very brief, there is so much information. Um, 
the course that I teach is a year-long course, so you know we go through all this stuff in a whole year, every day, Monday through Thursday for well, 10 months of the year. So I go into a lot more depth, but there's so much great material out there that you can get. But I'll end with the divine hiddenness argument. This is a one that's not uh, really popular, and a lot of people don't know about it, but it's becoming more popular, I think, because maybe the argument from evil atheists are abandoning that as a valid argument against God's name. So here's this argument. It's called the divine hiddenness argument. This argument says, if God was all loving and all good, he would have revealed himself so clearly that there would be no unbelievers in the world. But there are unbelievers in the world. And so God is not all loving and all good because he hasn't clearly revealed himself. And that's an interesting argument. And the way I respond to that, it's not, again, well-known, but it's in more scholarly circles. The way I respond to that is that God has clearly revealed himself. And how do you define clear? And given the mentality of the unbelieving mind, what we talked about last time, and second, um, I would just say, uh, that's not God hiding from man. It's actually man hiding from God. And it goes all the way back to the garden, doesn't it? As soon as Adam, as Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to hide themselves from God. So the divine hidden this problem, it's not a valid argument, and uh, it's rather man hiding from God. And so we need to uh, share the good news, and eventually, um, I think Scripture teaches that the church uh, will be triumphal in this world, and uh, we will have the victory uh, that was instituted with the new creation uh, with Christ's death on the cross.